Welcome back to Watch It Play. My name is Rodney Smith. We only have one news and update item, and that is in the last video I asked you guys if you like the news and update segments and the errors and corrections and Q&A, and the answer seemed to be yes, so we will continue with them, but I will try to keep them short so we can get back to the games as quickly as possible. Uh, we have lots of questions this time around, and I have lots of answers. I promise some of them will be right. But before that, we have some errors and corrections to make. In the last turn, um, one of the Orc Smashers attacked, and I forgot to activate the other Orc Smasher that's also on the board, because remember, if you have more than one of the same type of monster, if one of them is activated, the other one activates as well. So it's this Orc here, its tactic will require it to move uh, adjacent to the next closest hero. I'm going to put it here, next to our wizard, whom it's going to attack, and we'll roll, we'll add the attack modifier of 9, 12 plus 9, it's going to be 21, which is higher than our wizard's AC, even with the cleric shield bonus. So it's going to take another point of damage. Our wizard is in a bad way. The next correction, well, actually, it's, it's a, a change of heart, let's say, on my part. Uh, Major Malfunction 10 in previous videos and other people on Board Game Geek and through my own research, it seems that these tokens, these health point tokens, um, really should be used as damage counters on the heroes. So instead of having a pool of hit points at the beginning of the game that you remove as you get hurt, you remove them entirely and you just use the hit points stat as the beginning total and then as they're hurt, you put these little tokens on top of them. This really drives me crazy because the tokens for damage for the monsters have this nice sort of blood red explosion on them. They, they really look like damage counters, whereas the hit point counters here, the, the damage tokens for the heroes, are these nice little sh yellow shields. They don't look like they should be bad things. They look like they should be good things. So how I'm going to reconcile that in my mind is that as these go on to the player cards, they're going to be covering up the picture of the hero, sort of blotting them out. And so that's how I'm going to resolve in my mind that these are a bad thing and not a good thing. So there's our errors and corrections done with. Nice and short as we like it. Now the Q&A. From Dingamus, I've heard you can combine the games. Can you explain to what extent this works? Well, I'll put a link in the description for this video, which takes you to the Wizard of the Coast official um, adventure that they released, um, specifically for combining the two sets. It gives you a list of encounter cards to choose from each set of Wrath of a Shardle and a Castle Ravenloft, along with certain monsters to combine, and it tells you to put all the treasures together, and it gives you this three scenario campaign you can follow through using both sets. So that should give you an idea of how it will work. Uh, Futant3113 Andromedo asked, who gets the experience? Uh, why not put the monster card with the hero? You'll remember we defeated an Orc Smasher last time, and I put the experience card over here rather than putting it with the cards. Now, there's room here with the cards, but I'd rather not, um, first of all, confuse the monsters we defeated with the monsters that are still on the board, but also the experience, from what I understand, is a collective pool that all the heroes can draw from. So I'm just going to keep that over here, and maybe what I will do in the uh, description of future videos, I will try to include um, the total experience that's been collected by the party so far. The next question comes from Vegabondriot. Why do treasure cards have a price written in gold on the bottom? Yes, uh, the treasure cards do have a value, a dollar value, like this one here, the Potion of Healing, has a price of 600 gold. This is when you're using the campaign, because if you're playing a campaign game, uh, during the scenarios that you play, you do not collect treasure cards like these uh, when you defeat a monster. Instead, you draw from a random pool of treasure tokens, and those treasure tokens might say, you know, 100 gold, 200 gold, 400 gold, etc. And so you collect those, and then between the scenarios, you go to the shop, and you spend the gold that you've collected on a certain number of flipped over treasure cards that you can look at. So it's got a, an interesting little shopping mechanic, and then because it's a campaign, you carry those treasure cards over from scenario to scenario. So, I mean, it makes sense, because if you were drawing treasure cards, and you're playing multiple scenarios, your guys would just have piles and piles of stuff. So this way it kind of limits that. And it also makes the treasures a little bit more valuable, which can be fun. So definitely give that a try if you like this, uh, this game. Flex Do Right asks, if no one steps up to the guard and we let him explore from the bottom of the deck tile, what happens if uh, he exposes the tile shuffled into one of the last five? I know it's unlikely, but if we wanted to, we could with positioning shot and fear. What he's getting at here is there's a guard on uh, in the game right now, and whenever he's on a tile that has an exposed edge, it will draw out a new tile from the bottom of our tile deck here, which means if you were to use uh, spells and abilities to keep forcing him farther and farther away from the party and closer to exposed edge, 
every turn he would be forced to draw out new tiles and basically we could get to that tile at the bottom of the deck quicker where our objective is going to be found. So yes, you could do that. That's very clever. I never really considered doing that before and that is how it would work. Uh, Alexander TF writes, does the amount of experience need to change after leveling up or does it always stay at five? In this game, you only level up once. You can only go to level two, so the experience required is always the same, both to level up, uh, which, again, you can only level up to level two, and or to remove encounter cards. So if you spend five experience, you can uh, negate an encounter card that was going to take effect. Cartoons 80s 90s writes, I checked the rules and I didn't see any rules regarding line of sight, so I guess the game doesn't care about it. You're mostly right. The only thing they specify is that there can't be a wall between the tile you're on and the person that you want to attack or the monster you want to attack. Futant3113 says, wondering if there are outtakes around anywhere. Uh, listen, there have been a few. I don't always put them in because I don't like embarrassing myself too much. But if there are going to be outtakes, as we have had in some videos, they'll be at the end of the video. So stick around for the credits. Uh, like in the last video, we did have some outtakes, which some of you might have seen. Uh, and the last question, Violet Productions writes, what's a PEI? <laughs> well, Prince Edward Island is where I live, and the acronym for that is PEI. So if you hear me referring to that or writing that in the comments, that's what I'm referring to. Okay, thanks for sticking through all that. Now it's time to get Andrea out here, and we will be taking our cleric move. All right, Andrea is now here with us, back from her first day at high school. Congratulations, how was it? Long. Long. Did you guys play any games? Musical chairs and ping pong. Musical chairs. In high school, yes. Okay. All right, well, let's get on with playing Wrath of a Shardalon. All right, so we had several great moves submitted to us again. The one we chose was by Fonzie the Capybara. It's an awesome name. It's a pretty awesome name. And here's what he submitted. Recovering his wits from the noxious fumes the gibbering Mouther had sent out, the cleric whispered a prayer to the god of healing and the gods at Fantasy Flight Games. Please send Rodney the second edition of Descent. <laughs> Wait, that's not what it says. Um, oh, and send forth his sacred flame to strike down the monster. He could not allow his boon companions to be dazed again. If the Mouther was burned by his holy flame, then the god would cover his mage friend with the healing light. So, our cleric is going to attack with the sacred flame, which allows you to attack one monster within one tile of you. And if you hit, <laughs> why, why did you throw that ability I did. turn onto my, the my, floor? Uh, my arm just hit it. <laughs> Your amazing wizard powers. Oh, that's fun. We'll get uh, after. I'll, I'll be right back. So we've collected all the cards from the floor, everything's back to normal, or what we like to call normal around here. And we're going to attack with the Sacred Flame. Sacred Light shines from above, searing a single enemy with Holy Radiance. We're going to add 6 to this dice roll, I mean you're 14 or higher. 19. 19, excellent. So that more than defeats our Gibbering Mouther. Gives it 1 damage and it already had 1 damage, so we'll remove the model. We will add this three experience to our experience pool, giving us a total of five experience. And what else? Oh, we get to collect a treasure card. How good is that? Let's see what you get. Well, actually, you don't get it. We get to decide yeah, who's going to get this. The Blessed Shield. The Blessing of Behemoth protects you and your allies. We get to play this card immediately. And you and all heroes on your tile will gain a plus two bonus to AC while this item is in play. This is excellent. Who do we want to give a greater defense to? So, having looked over the stats of our different cards, it looks like the wizard and the rogue could most use the bonus AC, and our wizard already has a bonus, so... We're going to give it to that orc guy. Alright, the rogue. Oh, the rogue guy. The rogue gets the blessed shield. That's cool. Which means he'll get plus two AC and everyone on his tile will, so that's, that's excellent. Of course, right now he's floating out in outer space, so <laughs> no one's getting it. So, that's the end of the hero phase for the cleric, which means we can remove this dazed condition. And then we go on to the exploration phase, and because a new tile wasn't brought out, we must reveal a new encounter card. Walls of magma. The heat radiating from the magma-covered walls threatens to overcome you. So this is an environment card. Environment cards stay out and active until a new environment card comes in and replaces it. So, so what's the effect of this environment card? Whenever the active hero ends his or her hero phase adjacent to a wall, that hero takes one damage. Okay, so the walls are now on fire. They're burning from the volcanic lava. In That's this why it's called Walls of Magma. That's why it's called Walls of Magma. And this is bad because a lot of these hallways are narrow and it's hard to not end your turn next to a wall. Mm. 
Now, I could have used the experience we've collected to discard this encounter card, but I really want to save them to level up. Okay. All right? So, now, um, I, that's basically it, because if the cleric had monsters to activate, then we would do that, but there's, there's no. no monsters attached to this cleric, so we can move on to... My turn. Your turn. And so we'll start with your hero phase. What would you like to do first? I'm going to use the Potion of Healing, because my guy's kind of dying. All right, so we're going to use this Potion of Healing. A Grievous Wound fades as you drink this potion. This will return uh, two hit points. We'll remove two damage counters from our wizard, and now you can move or attack. I'm going to attack. All right, what would you like to use for your attack? Arc Lightning. The Arc Lightning. Lightning leaps from your outstretched hands, blasting your foes. You're going to get to attack up to two monsters. Um, we've got three to choose from. What would you like to do? These two guys. Okay, these two guys. Please. The Orc Smashers? Yep. Who do you want to try first? The one with the damage on it? One, yeah. All right, so let's roll. We're going to add seven. Eleven plus seven is eighteen. That is more than enough to damage our Orc Smasher. Good roll. So there's already a damage token on this one. It's going away. Now don't remove... Yes, actually, you control an Orc Smasher. So that's the card we will remove. And we'll add that to our experience pool. And because we slayed the monster, we can draw a treasure card. We're getting the Amulet of Protection. This magic amulet deflects attacks. So this gives us a bonus of plus one AC while the item is in play. Now the important thing about treasure cards is you can only ever take advantage of one bonus to your AC and a attack at a time. So since our rogue already has a treasure card that benefits him for AC, we'll probably give this to our wizard, uh, who also seems to be the brunt of a lot of attacks. And now, you're going to attack yeah, the other rogue smasher. Let's roll and see what happens. A 14! Plus a seven. Again, more than enough. Now, the Orc Smashers, as you might remember, has two hit points, so that does one damage. It's still on the board, but next turn, hopefully, we can get rid of it. Um, now, you can move if you'd like. Okay. One, two. All right, so you're going gonna to end your turn adjacent to a monster, but I guess you're trying to get to an edge. Well, you know what you could do is you can move you know, this the way. The problem is, I'm going to be by a wall. And you'll be by a wall. Do you think you can get so, down here where you're not next to a wall? Count it one, out. One, two, three, four. Perfect. So now we're on an edge and Andrew's not near a wall. Good thinking. I'd forgotten about that magma. I'd forgotten already. So because you're on the edge of a tile, um, we can do the exploration phase. We're going to flip over a tile. has the black arrow. also has a door on it here. And we're going to bring out a monster to put on the scorch mark. It's an orc archer. Put this with your character, and the model's going to go on the tile. And now it's time mm -hmm. for the villain phase. So we're going to draw an encounter card because of that black arrow. It's a curse, curse of the cage. Stepping on a pressure plate causes a cage to drop on top of you. <laughs> you are cursed. Place this card on your hero card as a reminder. You take a minus two penalty to your AC, and you cannot move while this curse is active. Instead of attacking, you or a hero on your tile can attempt to open the cage. You open the cage on a roll of 10 or more. And once you do that, you get to discard the curse. So we're going to put this on your card. You're now in a cage. Great. Again, we could have spent some experience points to remove that. Somebody you... wants to keep them. Well, well now that we've got a little extra experience here, if you'd like to spend that to remove it, I'd be okay with oh, that. No, I'm I, I'm cool in the cage. You're fine in the cage? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, then. So now we have to activate the Duragar guard, and this uh, character, this monster, if it's not adjacent to a hero and there's an uh, exposed edge on the monster's tile, it will bring out a new tile from the bottom of the tile stack. So let's do that right now. It's got another black arrow, but that's okay. We don't have to worry about that. Because oh. when uh, a black arrow is revealed on a tile that's brought up by a monster, we ignore it. But we do have to put down another monster. And the monster we're bringing out is an orc, well, it says orc archer. But you already have an orc archer? That means we get to discard it. So if, if a hero draws the same kind of monster type that they already have, um, then it can be discarded. So we're going to draw the next one. And it's the ah, human cultists! We're good cultists. friends with those guys. <laughs> this is like a flashback to another video series we did. Mansions of Madness. Alright, so we know how to handle, handle cultists, don't we? Oh yeah. So we're going to put that on the Scorch Mark. Harvey does. Yes, Harvey does. If you don't know what we're talking about, check out our older video series on the game Mansions of Madness. And uh, now, uh, the Duragar Guard is done, so we activate the Orc Archer. 
It says here, um, if the orc archer is adjacent to a hero, it attacks the hero with a punch. Well, it's not adjacent. If it's within two tiles of a hero, it attacks the closest hero with an arrow. So we have to roll the dice and add six. And nine plus six is 15. And your AC right now is 14 plus two minus two, so it's 14. So that unfortunately is a hit. It's gonna do two damage to you, all right? So I'm gonna add two damage tokens to you. You wanna throw those on there. And it's time. That's good. If I didn't do that po the potion, I think I would've been dead by then. That's a good point. If you hadn't had that potion, and if we'd forgotten to use it, we would've been in trouble. Mm -hmm. So now the human cultist is gonna activate. If the cultist is within one tile of a hero, it moves adjacent to the closest hero and attacks with a poisoned dagger. Otherwise, the cultist moves one tile towards the closest hero. So we're gonna move it onto this tile. And normally, you would move a, a monster from one tile to another by putting them on the scorch mark of the new tile. If it's covered up, like it is right now by this guard, we can put it anywhere we like. We're gonna have a little conversation. All right, they can chat, keep each other company. Cute. And that's good because we're done, cool. right? That's the end of the, this turn. Thanks for watching. In the next turn, you guys will be telling us what to do with Tarak, our rogue, who's right now floating around in a time leap and will be able to begin his next turn anywhere he wants. So think about that. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to reading your responses and producing the next video. We'll see ya.